All right, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good? Oh, there we are. Okay. Uh, did everybody appreciate the extra hour of sleep? Nice. Did everybody ask yourself this morning, why do we still do this? Because that's what I asked. Uh, I don't know why. And I read that like California already passed like a law that apparently we don't have to do this anymore, but here we are. I'm still trying to figure your Californians out. All right. Well, uh, it's good to be here. Um, you can pray for my father-in-law, my wife. Uh, I am with just me and the kids this week and next week because my father-in-law has been on a transplant list for a heart for six years and uh, got the call that they got a heart for him. And so I sent my wife to Minnesota, yeah, be praying for Fred. Um, they, he's recovering, obviously, as you can imagine. It's, it's a miracle every time I think about it. They, they, my wife sent me the text, the heart is in. And I was like, what a text. Like, it's a new heart in this guy's chest. But uh, it's amazing. So he's recovering, so you can be praying for him. Um, but uh, that means that I've gotten to enjoy uh, life as a single parent. I said bachelor earlier. Jen was like, that's not a bachelor. That, you have three kids at home. It's like, yeah, life is a single parent. Right, okay. So uh, the, the title of today's message is Rediscovering Abandoned Love. Rediscovering Abandoned Love. And I, I don't know if you guys have known this. The last two weeks, we've kind of been in a moment. And, and I feel like the Lord is speaking very strategically to us as a family. Um, we were going to do a series, and Rick felt from the Lord we were, that, to throw that series out. And he's just been preaching to us what the Lord is saying the last couple of weeks, and we're going to keep kind of doing this. And so I felt the fear of the Lord going, oh man, I'm up. And I, there's a, I'll be honest with you, there's a temptation to just go, well, I've got these like four great messages. I'll just pull one of those and we'll hit that. And, uh, but instead, I really want to be prophetic this morning. Do you know what that means? I mean, I, what I mean by prophetic, I, I want to speak what God is saying. We don't gather at this church to just hear good songs and then hear good sermons. You shouldn't come here for a good sermon. You should come here to encounter the Lord. And, and what preaching is, is it should be us coming and sitting ourselves before this bonfire and letting it melt our cold hearts, right? Our heart, our frozen hearts because of the things of this world, we sit before this bonfire and we just let it melt it. And... And so this morning, I, I, last night, I, uh, you know, I'm a single parent. I locked my kids out of my room at around <laughs> 6 or 7 p.m. I was like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> like, I'm locking the door. Hopefully the house is still intact. We'll find out. Um, and uh, I just, I, I was playing these old worship songs. And uh, how many of you just love some of those old worship songs? And uh, I was listening to As a Deer Panteth Forth the Water and... Uh, 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 give thanks. I, I forgot about that song. Do you remember that song? Like, give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the... Oh, yeah, we're going to sing it now. Oh, we're almost there. Um, but I was just singing all of those songs, and those songs were the songs that I met the Lord as a kid, you know, and I'm, they're wrecking me. I'm just like, oh, gosh, I remember these were the songs that stirred my heart to love Jesus. These are the songs that caused a 13-year-old to not have any friends and to carry his Bible around campus and tell people about Jesus. You know, like these are the songs that got me there, you know? And uh, I was praying this week and I said, God, what do you want to speak to this family? Like what is on your heart for us? And I, I just want to share that this morning. I don't want to share a good word. A, a, a really super put together word is my point. And uh, and I felt like during the prayer meeting on Thursday morning, uh, we were in here, band's playing, we're praying, and I just felt like they started to sing this song um, about the love of God, uh, how we love your name, Jesus, you're the beautiful one. And I was just like, oh, I'm not a singer, that's why I'm moving past that really quickly. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and I just felt like the Lord said, Revelation 2, I want to call them back to my love. Call them back to my love. Call them back to my heart. And so I want to read this. Revelation 2, verse 1. To the angel in the church of Ephesus write, I know your works, your toil, 
your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. So that first part is a great encouragement, right? And I, I feel like to us, you know, a lot of times preachers uh, preach like, nobody's going to church anymore, blah, blah, blah. They always preach that on Sunday to the, everybody that's actually at church, right? <laughs> so like you guys are the faithful ones. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, but God's talking to the faithful, I think, this morning. I think he's talking to you and, and, and saying, you've been faithful. You show up. You're here. You sing the songs. You're at church. But then he says this. But I have this against you, and I want us to receive that for a second. I have this against you. It's what God is saying to you, saying to you. That you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent, which means to turn, and do the things you did at first. And I feel like what the Lord is speaking to us this morning, and that's why I said the phrase, rediscovering abandoned love. I feel like God is wanting us to rediscover the, that abandoned love that we had at first. We don't just sing songs to an idea, amen? We sing songs to a man named Jesus. Jesus just isn't just this idea. He isn't just this construct that we've made. He's a living, active human Part human, part God, right? He made himself fully God and fully man when he came to the, the first time. Human God-man who's seated on a throne, who's making intercession for you right now, mentioning your name before heaven, interceding for you after your heart, day after day, every second of your life. We don't just pray to an idea. We don't just sing to an, to an idea. We sing and we pray and we talk about a living and active God. This word isn't just wise ideas. Like these aren't just Confucian sayings that we can apply to our lives so that way we can somehow like build a decent life. This is living and active. It says the, the word of God, it was made flesh. Jesus is this made flesh. This is, this is the thing that we set our hearts before day after day and day after day. It transforms our hearts just a little bit more. I feel like when we come to church, we want God to solve our problems and God wants to change our hearts. We go, okay, solve my problem today, word. And he goes, I don't want to solve your problem. I'm here to transform your life. I'm here to make you into something. I... I feel like what the Lord is saying to us is that Christianity isn't a box that we check. It's a God that we love, right? Like it's, it's not this thing that we just do so that we can say we did it. We went to church on Sunday, right? We, we had the devotional prayer time and then I went to my accountability partner and said, I have my prayer time and I went to church, I'm good, right? Like that's, that's not what this is about. This is about a man. This is about a God who loves you. A God who's active in speaking to you. A God who's, who's for you. A God who knows what tomorrow is gonna look like, has a plan for it, and if you would submit to him and follow his plan, tomorrow's gonna go better than today did. Right? Like, that's what this is. Like, there is a living and active God who formed you in your mother's womb. You are the dream of the God of the universe's heart. He dreamed you and then formed you and made you. That's who you are. And that's why this is so sacred. When, when you put it in that context, we don't just come to church to sing the songs and do the thing. We come to church to pour our hearts out before the one who made us, who fashioned us. The one who knows you better than you know yourself. Just like a mechanic who, who puts together an engine, he knows that engine better than anybody else because he put everything in its place, right? He knows you better than you know you. So I felt like God had this question for us. It 
Is our love for God something we know in our heads or is it something that's alive in our hearts? Is it something that we know in our heads or is it something that's alive in our hearts? I, I used to take my pastoral retreats when I was pastoring in New York, in New York City. Um, because I'm weird. Most guys like to go to, like, to a cabin in the woods, like super secluded and like peaceful and just like, you know, remnant. I did that once and I had like a panic attack. I was like, it's so quiet. Like, why is it so quiet? Like, this is so annoying. And I had to like drive to the nearest town. I'm like, people, praise God. And so <laughs> I would take my pastoral retreats to uh, get a, I'd get a hotel right in the center of Manhattan and I would just walk the city and with my Bible and my journal and just sit at different, I mean, there's just so many, I mean, you Washington Square Park and it just, it's so fun to just walk around and pray, and talk to God. And so I was walking down Fifth Avenue and St. Patrick's Cathedral, have anybody seen St. Patrick's Cathedral? It's one of the most amazing buildings I've ever seen in my life. And, uh, and, and there's like four others down that road. There's an Episcopal one and there's a Presbyterian one. You just walk down Fifth Avenue, you see all these buildings. And I sat in, in front of one of them and I was just sitting there with my Bible and my journal, just asking, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? Just talking to God. Just, I don't know, it's probably like six, seven years ago now. And, uh, and I looked over at St. Patrick's and I was like, man, that building is just awe-inspiring. That's like the spires are so tall and so sharp and so gorgeous. And I, and I heard the Lord say, that's a morgue. It's a mausoleum to a faith that once was. And, and, I, and I feel like so many of our churches in America are morgues, not life-giving places. Our, we've seen the greatest apostasy in American history the last five years. For those of you that are skeptical about the morgue comment, God spoke it, so you can take it up with him. I say God told me so once, but I remember feeling it. Like God goes, that's a morgue. There, there, there's, 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 a, there's a great apostasy that's happened in America. I don't remember, the statistics are all over the place at this point, but I would put the median at 60% have left the church in the last three years. 60% of the church in America is gone, left. And, and I want to read what, one of the reasons why. I, this guy Abraham Heschel, he said this. He said, religion has declined, not because it was refuted, not because it became, but it has become irrelevant, dull, oppressive, insipid. When, because of this reason, because faith has been completely replaced by creed. Worship has been replaced by discipline. Love has been replaced by habit. And the crisis of today is ignored because of the splendor of the past. When faith becomes an heirloom that we pass down rather than a living fountain we drink from, when religion speaks in the name of authority rather than the voice of compassion, its message becomes meaningless. In other words, what we're suffering from is not, in fact, get this, America has been, we've never been better at doing church. We have the best infrastructure. We have the most resources. We have the best ideas. People are walking away. And it's not because we don't give to the poor enough. Do you know that the greatest humanitarian efforts on the planet right now are Christian organizations? Between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, probably the most, the, all of the humanitarian efforts on the earth, you go to any inner city and it's gonna be some church putting on some homeless shelter. I used to help run one in Kansas City. Like there, 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 there is, at every turn, it's not because the, the church doesn't care enough about the poor. It's not because the church doesn't care enough about justice issues. The church is right center in most of those conversations. It's because we've made it about something and not someone. We've made it about stuff. We haven't made it about God. We've forgotten that this isn't about what we do. This isn't about what we sing. It's not just about standing in this building and making sure we come here. It's about a man who created you for fellowship. And he wants to meet with you. And that's the thing that we're missing is that we've, we do everything else, but we forget the heart of the whole thing. And the heart of the whole thing is him. This happens all the time, right? This happens in marriages. They become about all of their kids and all the activities and all the stuff and then all of a sudden they grow apart and then they get divorced when the kids leave the house and everybody goes, what happened? Well, you forgot about each other. 
You made this about everything else. You forgot about love. I remember when uh, I was falling in love with my wife, you know, when we were engaged, I had to like get up every morning at 5 a.m. to go work. I was overseeing the prayer room in Kansas City in the early, early times. And uh, we would stay up, you know, till like 10 was like the cutoff. Like, okay, I got to go home and go to bed. And then uh, pretty soon we'd be sitting in my driveway and it'd be 11. And then it would be 1. And then the next time it would be 3 a.m. And I'm like, I got to get up in two hours. But one more thing, right? Like, when was the last time when you talked to God, you were like, I need one more hour? When was the last time you pulled out your Bible and it caused, moved you to the point of tears and you went, I actually just want to stay right here in this passage. I got to keep reading this. Right? I was just doing this with Ezekiel just the other day. I was reading Ezekiel, which is like a super weird book, by the way. And for most of you, probably like if you've ever gotten lost in Ezekiel, it's a crazy place to get lost in. That's a, that's a ride. That's a trip. Um, <laughs> But I, was, I, I got to this place in Ezekiel, and all of a sudden I started to understand God's heart towards Israel. And I went, oh, wait, this is, I need to reread that now, because now I get it. Because he called the city the New Jerusalem. He doesn't call it the New Jerusalem in Ezekiel. It's called that other places. He calls it the place where God is, and they were all excited to be there. And I went, oh, wait, I got to reread the rest of Ezekiel, because that's what he's getting at. He wants to be with them. When was the last time... Your prayer time was the thing you looked forward to, not the thing that you tried to gut out. See, I think our faith has become a discipline that we do. I think our love for God has become a habit we work to put in place. But that's not, that's not alive. That's not living. God's calling us to get our hearts alive again, to make that living again. So how do we do it? John uh, 15, 9. It's one of my favorite verses. I would say that this is probably one of the most profound verses in all of Scripture. And the reason why I say that is because what it means, what it reveals about who we are and who God is. It's a very short verse. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you Abide in my love. Why is that so profound? He's saying that is the same love that God loves God. God loves you. The same love, because he's Jesus and God, they're God. They're one, right? Within the Trinity. The same love that God loves God, he loves you. Suddenly it puts your worth and value into a crazy different perspective than where you probably think you are in God's heart. Because you're not just some minion that he created to serve him. He loves you the same way he loves himself. And his call to us is, one, to know that, and two, walk in it. To abide in my love, he says. The same love that God loves God God loves you. So rediscovering an abandoned love, there's three steps there. One, well, let's not use our middle finger for one, huh? Let's not do that. <laughs> I went like this, and then I went one. <laughs> I just want to sit in this moment and reflect. <laughs> I can't believe it. I can't believe I did that. Um, <laughs> if I would, anyway, okay. So the first step. <laughs> As the Father has loved me, the Father has loved me, which is God's love for God. We need to understand how God feels about himself. Second, uh, I have loved you. We need to understand God's love for us. And the third step, well, see, that's a better place for it. Um, and the third step is uh, to abide in his love, to receive God's opinion about us, Amen. And so I'm going to look at these three real briefly, and then we're going to pray and hopefully pour ourselves out before Jesus. Um, so the first one, knowing God's love for God, as the Father has loved me, the first expression of perfect love. Now, before there was anything, before Genesis 1, there was nothing except for God. 
I always, since I was a kid, I love to pause and just let that kind of blow my mind. Like, wait, there was nothing. Like, then who made God? You know, like, nobody. It's just God. You're like, uh, and then like your brain kind of fries. The synapses go, wait, but how? And you're like, exactly, he's God. And he existed before anything else. And God, theologians would call God, a great summary for the Trinity is they would call him a community. God is a community. He, within himself, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have this amazing relationship. And there's a whole lot to break down there, but I don't have time to break down the doctrine of the Trinity for you, except to say it's real, it exists, and God is a community. And the community of God existed before all of creation. And God is God in all of his attributes all of the time. One of the things that God is, is what? He's a creator. And so because God loves, God creates. He made the same thing possible in humans. When humans love, what happens? They create other humans. God was giving us a picture of himself that because God loves, God creates. And so God creates and he says, let there be light. And he creates the stars and the universe and the earth and all of these things. And each day he creates this canvas and this canvas, this, this place setting for the sixth day. So he could create people who are like him in his image. And God, he speaks everything into existence except for this sixth day he steps out of his dwelling place. He steps onto the earth he created and he goes into the dirt and he begins to fashion the first man. And he fashions him with his hands. And then he sticks his lips to Adam's lips and breathes life into him. See, no other creature in the universe no other creature is made in his image except us. The angels, the other Elohim that he created, none of those things get to partake in what we get to partake in. We were made for fellowship with him. I heard one preacher say once, I can tell what your opinion of who God is is based on what you think Adam saw when he opened his eyes for the first time. Right? He breathes life into Adam's lungs, and then Adam opens his eyes for the first time. What do you think Adam saw? Do you think he saw a God who was like, all right, sucker, get to work? <laughs> do you think he was like, oh, you're already opening your eyes well? <sighs> no, I think he saw the smile of a happy God going, hey, my first one, you're like me. And what did the Bible say? It said he dwelt with them in the cool of the day. It was his delight to walk and talk with them in the garden. That's why he created them. And in the same way, you were formed and fashioned in your mother's womb. God stuck his hands in your mother's womb and formed you. You were a dream that God dreamed. And he said, I have to create this one. Each one of you is an expression of God's love. The very fact that you are breathing right now is an expression of God's love. It's an expression of God's desire. You are not an accident. You're not, you're not, you weren't, I don't care how you were made, you came to be, what your story has been like, you're not an accident. God intended for you to be alive. God intended for you to have a destiny. God intended for you to be with him for all of eternity. God intended for you to be, and he is after your heart. Now, some of you will be tempted to hear that and go, man, Susie's got to hear this because she's always blowing up my phone about how sad she is about her purpose in life. And go tell Susie, because Susie needs to hear this probably. But I'm not talking to Susie right now. Or whoever poor Susie is. It's a random fun name out of the air. I'm talking to you right now. You are not an accident. I feel like some of you need to hear that. You were created with a purpose, and your purpose was to be with God. From beginning to end, your purpose wasn't to be your career. Your purpose wasn't to be the things that are in your heart. Your purpose wasn't to, you know, we, in America, we talk about, like, you gotta live your dreams. Your dreams are lame. His are better. Your purpose is to walk in them. Right? I, 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 anyway, I could go off on that one. You talk to guys that can't sing, and they're like, I feel like I'm meant to sing. And I'm like, no, you're not, because you can't sing. <laughs> 
I've talked to people like that. They're like, oh, I feel like I'm going to be an artist one day. I'm like, well, you should start learning how to do that better. Um, <laughs> just because it's in your heart doesn't mean you should do it. Um, <laughs> As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. The second step is encountering God's love for his people. As I have loved you. Love, by definition, demands an expression. To be shared and to be multiplied. God wanted others to experience the joy of the Trinity's experience. What they experienced. See, God doesn't lack anything. He has no need of anything. So that, don't get the idea that I'm saying that we add something to God. God is self-sufficient. He needs nothing. But he longs for you. He desires you. Jesus says this in John 17, and this is your, your homework, is to go read John 17 and insert your name where it says they and them. Insert your name instead. Because what Jesus says is this. He says, Father, I desire that they whom you have given me would be with me where I am, that they would be with us, a part of us. It's his prayer before the cross, and he goes to the cross not so that you can get out of hell. He, I mean, that's a great benefit. He goes to the cross so you can be with him forever. He goes to the cross with the intention of love. I want to display my love on the cross so that when I get up there, they're with me. When I get down there, they're with me. You can't earn God's love. You can't improve upon it. You can't try to make him love you more. It's not possible. He's not a parent to win approval of. He already loves you. You're already his. You're already the dream of his heart. And that's why those that, those that fall away and don't end up with him, it breaks his heart. It's why he cares about us sharing this good news. Not because he wants everyone that he created to receive it. It's why we show no prejudice, I can't say that word, in the church. We show no prejudice in the church to other races or cultures because, uh, well, I mean, maybe if their cultures are like really bad, I shouldn't say that, but other races and other people, I mean, like if they're sacrificing and cannibalism, we don't, you know, support that. But um, <laughs> we show no prejudice to other people based on the color of their skin is what I'm trying to say, based on where they're from or what country they're from because every single person is a dream of God's heart that we want in the family. That's who they are. Here's, so here's what I think the judgment seat looks like, and this is, to me, displays how much God loves you. Is I think that when we stand before God, whenever that is, and it's gonna happen, and some of you here, if you're here and you don't know that this is gonna happen, this is going to happen. This little 90-year internship, 100 years, you know, maybe if you're on the wellness program, um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, This little lifelong internship that we have, it's an internship because you're an eternal vessel and you're going to live forever. Did you know that? You're going to live forever whether you love God or not. You're going to live forever. And the status of how you live is determined before that judgment seat. And We're going to stand before him, and our internship here is going to get judged. And it's not going to get judged based on how awesome you were. Some of you are really awesome people. Some of you have done really great things. None of that matters in front of that judgment seat. I can't take anything that I have done or accomplished in this life to with me for the judgment seat. Everything that I've done or accomplished or do in my life is simply preparing me for that day. Does that make sense? My dad is a construction worker. Construction work is the vehicle God has chosen to sanctify his heart so that he loves God when he stands before him. I'm a pastor, preacher, writer. God has used those things to be the thing that sanctifies my heart so when I stand before him, I have to answer for what became of my heart. So whatever you do, it doesn't matter. It's insignificant. Sorry. It really doesn't. That's why I said our dreams are lame. Sorry if that hurt anybody's feelings. Our dreams are lame because he can't take them with you forever. Your dreams are simply to make you and mold you and to become like him so you can be with him. 
So I think when we stand before the judgment seat, he asks us one question. What did you do with your heart? Did you know me? Did you love me? And I think a movie plays. We know this from Ecclesiastes 12, right? Every deed is called into, into judgment. And I think the movie of our life plays, but I think there's two screens. I think there's one screen that plays our life every second of it, and then there's one screen that, that plays what God was doing every second of your life. And here's what I think happens, and this is why I think we weep, is because I think you begin to look at your life and you look at what he was doing and you realize every time I was alone, he was there. Every time I felt pain, he was there. Every time that I sinned and failed, he was right there ready to help me if I had just turned to him. If I had just said yes, he would have helped me. If I, when I felt alone and I self-loathed and looked inside for answers, if I would have looked outside and received his, he was there ready to help me. Every single second of the day, he was right there. He never leaved me. And here's what I think we say, is I think we, 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 we look at that and before the judgment seat, and we go, if I had known he loved me this much, I would have lived very differently. If we could just understand how much he loves us, we would live so different. We wouldn't be stuck in the muddied puddles of people's opinions about us. We wouldn't be stuck in our self-importance and pride and, and arrogance. We wouldn't be stuck in trying to prove ourselves to that one kid in high school who said you'll never amount to anything, but yet still there in the back of our head, every accomplishment we try to achieve, we would have put them outside and said, God, I just want you. There's so many of us that make so many strategic decisions about our lives that are based on our careers and our life when most of your strategic decisions should be based on how your heart can love him more. Because he loves you. I don't know how else to say that this morning. Your God is for you. I want to read this. This is just... I didn't read this first service, but I just I feel this in this moment. Isaiah 49, I just want to read this for you real quick. Maybe this is for somebody here, I don't know. And this is a very, this is a very, just for any theologian in the room, this is a very messianic, very important messianic scripture. But I want to apply it to us because I think we can. It's uh, verse 14. He says, but Zion has said, well, let me go one more verse up. He said, sing for joy, O heavens. Exalt, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. But Zion, and I think this is us, says, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. We look at these moments in our life where Pain, frustration, maybe the story that you've lived has been hard, has not been easy, and you've said, I'll go to church, but I don't feel like God's there. The Lord has forsaken me, is what some of us say. And this is what God res responds back with. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child or have not compassion on the son of her womb? These even may forget, but surely I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands, and your walls are, and the walls of destruction, because this is to Israel. Your destruction, your hardship, your story that you've had to walk through is ever before me. But he's with you. Not just with you, he says, I've engraved you on the palm of my hand. I, I don't forget you. I, I, in fact, I'm right behind you if you would just turn around. I want to walk with you. I feel like some of you right now, you're feeling discouraged or lost or hurt or I don't know what it is. But he wants to tell you, I've engraved you on the palm of my hand. Like I'm, I'm with you. I see the tears. I heard, I heard you last night. I'm with you. Just turn to me. See, I think, 
I think what the problem is for most of us is we want to prove so hard to God and to others that we can live this life when like all of these pages basically say we can't. Like we're depraved in our own strength. Our, it, our, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Like our, our weakness, our inability to get through the pain and the struggles and the, the issues of this life, the, abil- the ability in us to do that is impossible. We need him. That's the whole point. In fact, I'm just totally off notes. This isn't even how I ended last service. I just felt that verse. The, in the prayer room the last week, the, one of the verses the Lord keeps highlighting to me is, is Psalm 34. I think it's six or seven. But he goes through the sequence of, I called to the Lord and he answered me. And those who turn to the Lord, their faces are radiant, will never be put to shame. But then he says this verse, and it, it kind of makes me cry every time. It just says, this poor man cried. This poor man cried. And he heard me. And he answered me. And saved me from all of my troubles. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I just feel I'm going to interrupt my message and just I'm going to end right here. Worship team, you can start coming out. I just feel that there's some of you that you struggle with the love of God because you have a disagreement with God. You hate what he loves. He loves you. You don't love you. He's for you. You can't imagine somebody being for you. He's walking with you through this life. And because of your inability to receive his love, you've walled off your heart from him. And Jesus is standing next to you, just like I said with that movie. He's right there. If you would just turn and say, God, I'm done trying. Take my life. He will meet you right where you're at. He has the answers that you're looking for. He has the, he has the strength that you're longing for. He has the peace that you're reaching for. But we just have to turn to him. Would you stand with me? Father, I don't want regret when I stand before your throne. God, I don't want to wait until I get before your throne to say, if I had known you loved me this much, I would live differently. Father, I want my heart to burn. I want my heart to be alive, Jesus. I don't want to live a dead religion, God. I don't want to live an idea. I want to talk to the living God. I want to know you, Jesus. If you're here this morning, I'm going to do an old-fashioned altar call. We've just been doing them. I want you to come and lay, lay your heart before the throne here at the altar and just say, God, I want to know your love, and I'm done trying on my own strength. Just come on forward right now. Just come and kneel before the Lord. I, just, I, I want us to just sit before him this morning. Some of you I just feel when I was reading that Isaiah verse, you've just been white-knuckling it, trying so hard, so hard to make things work, and God's saying, no, I want you to release that. I want you to let go this morning. Give me your heart. Could a woman forget the child of her womb? Some forget, but he says, I will not forget you. I love you. I pray, God, that you would make Father, take the the love that we know that we have, God, from our heads, God, and put it in our hearts. Jesus, let your presence fill this place. I'm just going to take a minute, and I'm just going to let the, I I believe God's real. I believe God's here. I want to let the Lord speak to us for a second. So would you just invite the presence of the Holy Spirit? Just with your words, just use your mouth, open up your mouth and just say, say, God, come and meet us right now. 
Fill this place with your presence. Fill this place with your love. Touch our hearts, Jesus. Touch our hearts, Father. God, I'm done striving. I want your love, God. I, I want to return back to my first love. I want a faith that's real. I want a love that's real. God, touch my heart. I don't want to be in a hurry right now, especially since we don't have a second service. I just want to sit for a minute. Let the Lord speak to you. God is speaking to some of you right now, and I want to challenge you. Some of you are out there in that audience, and you have not heard the Lord speak, and this is the moment he wants to speak to you right now. And so I just want you to verbalize it to him. Say, God, speak to me. Just receive what the Lord wants to pour out right now. Come, Jesus. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to this morning, I'm going to start looking over here and go around. I would like for you to raise your hand because I want to pray for you right now. If you want to receive Jesus and you have not, raise your hand right now. I'd love to pray for you. Yeah. Raise your hand right now. You want to give your life to God. Good, good, good. Pray with me right now. Say, Father, I'm done walking in my own ways. I'm done striving in my own strength and I'm done sinning my sin. I repent. And I receive your ways. I receive you, Jesus. And I want to give my life to you all of my days. Touch my heart, God. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us to take this next five minutes and we're just going to sing. We're going to worship with the worship team. They're going to lead us into a great song, pouring out our heart before God. And I want you to sing straight to him like, they're, like he's a real living man. Not just sing to an idea. Don't just sing to the worship team. Sing to the living and active God who's here. Sing to him. We're going to worship.